Good morning. morning. Welcome to Holy Communion at Trinity Lutheran Church on this day of Pentecost. Welcome to those who are joining us later on YouTube. We'll get that worship service uploaded as quickly as we can this week. A couple of announcements. The first announcement I need to make involves the masking today. Um, When we adopted the policy of Going by the CDC guidelines, we were assuming that the CDC was going to update things earlier in the week than they do. This has caught us the last two weeks. Last week, we should have been yellow in this space because our CDC code was yellow, but we were not. We didn't announce that. We didn't put that out there. This week, we announced that we were yellow, which we were as of the middle of the day on Wednesday. However, if you are like I am and recreationally troll the CDC website (laughs) for, say, roughly the last two years, you know that we are actually green today in Porter County. What? Yes, we are green today in Porter County. As of Wednesday, actually, the the number of cases had dropped. So, we have it posted on our doors that we are yellow, and we alerted all of you via email that we are yellow. I don't care what you do today. If you wish to mask, please do. If you are in the loft, you're masking whether you like it or not. If you don't want to mask and you are on the floor, you do not have to. We're going to treat this as though it's optional, okay? Because the CDC color is green, even though our door says it's yellow. And we are going to adjust when in the week we tell you what the code is so it's likelier to be accurate, okay? So, we are officially green today, according to the CDC, and I want to make sure that there's no confusion about that, or there's no more confusion about that than there already is. All right. On to other matters. Welcome to all who are visiting with us this morning, or who are joining us for the first time on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. Reminder, we have a lot of different music going on. You heard the bells ringing during our uh, prelude time. Please be mindful of those of us uh, that want to hear the bells ringing when they are playing. We have music from the choir and from Joyful Noise today. 
The choir is singing the hymn of the day today. You'll note that in your worship folder. Please remain seated during that time. The choir is going to handle that music. A couple of updates about membership. One, we saw the news that Catalan Calais had died a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Catalan will be buried in a private ceremony this week. Uh, on Tuesday morning, I will be doing that, and then we, will, we still need to schedule her memorial service uh, with family, but the burial will be happening this week. Uh, also, Betty McGinley uh, has entered hospice care as of Friday. Betty McGinley, longtime member of this congregation. Um, her phone is still working, but only for about a day. It's going to be disconnected this week, um, but she is in the home with family and hospice care. If you want to get a hold of family, I do have a good number for reaching her daughter who is, is in the house with her uh, for the duration. But please keep Betty McGinley and her family in your prayers. And finally, fellowship this morning is a special thank you to all of our musicians. Uh, the worship team has put that together with help from the hospitality team to get it put out for us since most of the worship team have to work right now. Uh, so we thank the hospitality team for setup, and we will take care of the rest of that. But uh, please join us downstairs afterwards for that special fellowship uh, to thank our many musicians. A reminder that all who are baptized and receive communion are invited to do so this morning at the time of distribution. Come down the center aisle. I have bread to either side of me are trays with individual glasses. You can take one of those glasses. The assisting ministers will pour the wine, and then you can leave the glass in the baskets at the ends of the front aisles. I invite you to stand and face the font for Thanksgiving for baptism. Oh, and it's the last day of Easter. So, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the waters of baptism, we have passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ. And we are a new creation. For this saving mystery, and for this water, let us bless God, who was, who is, and who is to come. We thank you, God, for the river of life flowing freely from your throne, through the earth, through the city, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters you flood us with mercy. Our sin is drowned forever. You open the gates of righteousness, and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ, you calm and trouble the waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. You have become our salvation. Now, breathe upon this water and awaken your church once more. Claim us again as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst. Cleanse our hearts. Wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and lamb, be honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving, now and forever.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God, our Creator, the resurrection of your Son offers life to all the peoples of earth. By your Holy Spirit, kindle in us the fire of your love, empowering our lives for service and our tongues for praise, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite the children to come forward. Sunday without a present. Thank you. Can I open it later? Okay, good. All right. Well, hello, all of you. Welcome. Oh, we got another comment. My own. All right. So, what's different about this room than it's been for the last two months? It's red. It's red up there. Where else is it red? Well, the carpet's been red. <laughs> the carpet's been red. Yes, the carpet is red. You are right. And your shirt is red, which is good, too. Hugo. The thing on my thing. The stole is red. That's red. Yeah. The banners up there are red. Chelsea? You forgot. There's a lot of red. Those flowers are red. You're right. The flowers in the windows are red. It's red because it's Pentecost. Pentecost is the last day of Easter, and it's the day we'll hear about it in our first reading about when the Holy Spirit shows up on the disciples after Jesus had left. So, the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit look like? Anybody have any idea? He has wings? Yes, yeah, sometimes. There's a couple of pictures in here of, that seem to be trying to make it be the Holy Spirit. Yes, yeah, Chelsea? He would want, of course he wears red. Because <laughs> red is the best color. Yes. You forget, it popped out of your head. That happens to me so much. There are a couple of pictures in here that might be a thing. There's a sign over here that says, Come Holy Spirit, and is there a critter on that sign? Like, what kind of critter is that? It looks like a, it could be an owl. It's usually a different kind of bird. It's usually a dove. But I think you know, the Holy Spirit being an owl, I think, is way cooler. And the Holy Spirit being a dove, there's some other stuff on that banner behind us. What do you think that's supposed to be? The yellow and, and, and orange things. Yeah, can Person saw what? The flames. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is just is seen as being fire. So that's kind of a weird for a person to look like a bird or to look like fire. The Holy Spirit's hard for us to see and hard for us to know what he's doing, or I usually say what she is doing, because we don't even know what the, the Holy Spirit identifies as being a man or a woman or something completely different. But what does the Holy Spirit do? Any ideas? Yeah? He saves our life. That's a good one, yeah. He heals people. The Holy Spirit forgives our sins, yeah. So the Holy Spirit did not die on the cross. Jesus did. But the Holy Spirit's got an important job. The Holy Spirit tells us all of that. So here, here's a way to think about this. Here's a question. Who here believes in Jesus without any help? Who, whose hand is not up? Yeah, I, I do not believe in Jesus without any help. A Holy Spirit believes in Jesus for us. We aren't able on our own to believe in God. This may seem strange. We may think, well, yeah, I do. 
course I do. I was in seminary. People said to me, you can't believe in Jesus on your own. I was like, I've been doing it all this time. But we say the Holy Spirit is actually the one trusting in Jesus for us. We wouldn't know all that. So yes, the Holy Spirit is healing us and forgiving our sins and giving us life. Because what the Holy Spirit is doing is trusting God where we could not. So if you're ever at a point in your life where you're like, I don't think God has this under control. I don't believe God's in charge. Which there happens at times. There are times we can be that upset. Right? We can say, I don't believe God's got this. You know what? Holy Spirit believes for us. And so even if we're doubting, the Holy Spirit is believing for us. And Jesus promises us that that is good enough. In fact, that's everything that God takes care of believing for us. That's really something, isn't it? And that can be a hard idea to get because you want to think, I want to say I do it myself, but are there any other things that you can't do entirely on your own? Yeah, a lot of things you can't do entirely on your own. I was determined when I grew up I was going to do things on my own. You know what I do? Ask for help still. It's a good thing to ask for help. The Holy Spirit helps us no matter where we are in believing in Jesus. All right? You all are awesome. Thank you for being with us, okay? reading from Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound, like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord.
For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord. fighting by violent means if necessary. 
by which I mean we'll use violence to keep you from fighting. We might have to crucify a Jesus if he gets too uppity. Jesus offers a different kind of peace, one that is in the cross. The Holy Spirit keeps calling us into the cross. There is peace that the world offers in the situations we face. We seem to be in the midst of unending mass shootings. Every now and then, one is especially bad and makes the news, but they're happening all the time. What do we do? What kind of peace does the world offer? The peace the world offers in a mass shooting is doing nothing because we can't deal with it. I don't have it in me to deal with guns. I'm not a gun person. I don't have it in me to deal with arguments about the Second Amendment with people who don't understand it. I don't have it in me to fight about what law enforcement officers should and shouldn't do. Or maybe I don't have it in me to listen to one more victim's story, one more nurse's story, one more sobbing parent. I don't have it in me to listen to this and try to reason with people my side of the argument, because if I do, it'll get shut down. If I do, the entire world will say, not now. Don't talk about this now, or if you're going to talk about this now, only talk about it if you're going to agree with me. And so we run into a cross that says, don't do anything. And if you do anything, expect bad things to happen. Or maybe you face, here in the state of Indiana, the latest bizarre anti-trans movement to prevent transgender girls from playing K-12 sports. The governor vetoed a bill, and the supermajority in the House and the Senate overruled it. And maybe you say, what can we do? I just can't face the supermajority and what it has behind it. Or maybe you say to yourself, I don't like how this went, but I like a lot of what the supermajority does for us. I'm not sure how to fight this without getting in a lot of trouble. And there is the cross enforcing the peace of this world. If we raise trouble, there will be more trouble for us. The world will try to shut it down. The cross functions that way as it functioned for Jesus, shutting him down when he did too much to upset the apple cart in the Roman Empire. Some call Pentecost today the church's birthday. Uh, I have a lot of feelings about that. The short answer is no. Uh, if you want the long answer, we can talk later. But. If we're going to pretend that this is the church's birthday and here in the ELCA, how are we doing here in the ELCA today? How are we doing as a church that set the goal of being at least 10% people of color by 1998 and in 2022 remains 98% white? Well, some of you have followed what's been going on around our church. I tried about a dozen times to figure out how to condense this into something that wouldn't take all morning. There are particulars that are happening in our church, particulars involving a black pastor denied due process when charged with abuse, and a white pastor not even slapped on the wrists for legal problems that are matters of public record. There's the particular of a synod forcing a black pastor to out himself as being under investigation for abuse while running for bishop, and yet not requiring a white pastor to reveal that they were, in fact, told by the courts that if it went to trial, they would likely be convicted of illegal behavior. There's the story of a black pastor being removed from his call under, at best, if he reasons, and removed from his Latino congregation on the day of the Virgin of Guadalupe, which I don't know very much about, but it's the highest holy day for Latino Christians in the United States. It's bigger than almost anything. 
to have someone removed on that day and have the authorities show up and say that we have removed this person, we're not going to explain why, and to be led by someone who is white and English speaking, well, that was really horrible because the Virgin of Guadalupe is a day historically when Latino Christians gather and give thanks that Jesus loves them despite, despite what the Catholic missionaries were telling them. But it was also a day when the whites would know all the Latinos are in church and we can round up the ones we want. The ones who are wanted for various crimes, we can just nab them today. For a church to barge into a Latino congregation on that day and remove somebody. It's not culturally insensitive, it's awful. But leadership didn't listen, even when Latinos under them said, any day but today. We have a black bishop removed from office for requiring a brief medical leave, and a white bishop protected as a church structure bends over backwards despite calls from now all quarters, including the presiding bishop, that they leave. And when all of this happens in our church, we run into the cross, and the cross that we run into is for some reason, instead of facing the racism that's going on, our church pits one minority group against another. White bishop is transgender, black person involved on the other side, it must be LGBTQ plus black versus black. Must be this fight between minority groups, never facing the actual problem. And while these are particulars, there are much broader problems. In my time as a Christian in the ELCA, I have attended countless synod gatherings around this country in which people of color are used as window dressing. I remember a synod assembly in which our budget slashed funding for a black church that was then expected to provide the choir for our closing worship. And time and time again, black congregations are lifted up as examples of how our mission dollars are going to good work, only to find out that we've shut that congregation down, and often because its pastor has begun asking uncomfortable questions. We have a document written by BIPOC Lutherans about how to take our diversity seriously has been largely ignored in the three years that it has been published. We have a church that likes to portray itself as being extremely socially progressive, primarily defining itself over against other churches that we think of as conservative. And so we assume we can't possibly have any problems. And meanwhile, our black, indigenous, and people of color within this church say to us, we want to stay, but why would we trust you? We are, as Lutherans, in practice, too often, a church not of Christ, but a church of whiteness. And I don't mean that it's bad to be white. I'm white. Didn't need to tell you that, it's obvious. But whiteness has all the privileges that go with that and the assumption that we deserve them and other people don't. Whiteness is the idea that we are superior to others. And in practice, our Lutheran church uses Christ to preserve our being white. And we use the cross to shut down anyone saying otherwise. If a black pastor says, I see racism, we find some other minority group to pit against him in the hopes that they will crucify each other and leave us alone. That's the peace that we try to create. It's a peace that the prophet Jeremiah decried 
And it's the piece that Martin Luther decried 2,100 years later in his 95 Theses. Theses 92 and 93. Away with all those false prophets who say to the people of Christ, peace, peace, and there is no peace. Blessed be all those prophets who say to the people of Christ, cross, cross, and there is no cross. We must say cross. We must name that the cross happens again and again. It's the only way to get to where there is no cross. We won't make there be no cross, but Christ will. The cross is where Christ is. Christ is the one who's going to take care of it, but we, we have to sort of let him do it and not trust that we've got it figured out. In today's gospel, Jesus has just told the disciples that he is the way. The famous statement, I am the way and the truth and the life. Whoever believes in me comes to the Father. No one comes to the Father but by me. Philip's response, show us the Father, becomes especially upsetting to Jesus. I literally just told you, like just now, like two seconds ago. Hadn't even, the echo is still in the room of me telling you. What's going on? When Jesus says he's the way, he means he is a way of life. He is someone to follow. He, the way he does things is the way God is God in the world. And Jesus' way winds up at a lot of crosses. He faces some smaller ones, like when he feeds thousands of hungry people and gets in trouble because, you know, what motivation do they have to work now that they got a free lunch from Jesus? He faces smaller crosses when he heals people. You were healing people on the Sabbath, Jesus. We need that day for not healing people. Or for loving people who we say don't deserve to be loved. Don't you know what sort of woman this is? Yes, so? Don't you know where that person is from? A uh, Samaritan, yeah, I know. And there's the great big cross that Jesus faces for daring to suggest that the world could be other than what we would like it to be. On Pentecost, we celebrate the Holy Spirit coming into our lives, coming into us to keep us in the way of life that Jesus lived. The Holy Spirit keeps calling us into the cross. The Holy Spirit says, I see crosses in the world, and it is your job as Jesus' brothers and sisters to go to them and be in them, to be in solidarity with those who suffer. I'm reluctant to call Pentecost the church's birthday because that's extremely misleading. There are two things that can be church. They both go by the same name, but they are different things. There is a 501c3 registered in the state of Indiana. There's a denomination registered in Minnesota. There's multiple denominations around the world calling themselves churches, and they have human beings and structures and bylaws and treasurers and all the things that human organizations need to function. And there's the body of Christ. And those two things overlap, but they are not the same. We can call ourselves whatever we like. We could change our name tomorrow to something completely different. We are the body of Christ because of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit keeps calling us into the cross. If we want to be church, we are to follow her to the cross where Jesus is. We as a church are not to be presumptuous. We've got the spirit, we've got it all figured out, but we are to be bold in going to the crosses in this world. Our reading from Romans 8, Paul exhorts the Romans, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but a spirit of adoption 
Yesterday at the men's Bible study, we asked, what, what is Paul talking about? This is Paul talking at intermission to a team that is losing because they're playing poorly. You're playing scared. You did not receive a spirit of being timid. You received a spirit of being Jesus' children. Get out there and act like it. You're God's children. Do something. Be bold. The Holy Spirit keeps calling us into the cross. We are to say cross when we see it, and we are to go to it when we see it. It can all seem overwhelming to do, I know. Every last thing that comes along is just another example of how we are not strong enough to face what the world throws at us. Just this Thursday, in a conversation led by my classmate Leah Shade, professor at Lexington Theological Seminary in Kentucky, she shared that when the shooting in Uvalde, Texas happened, she went home and shut the door and said, I'm done. I have nothing left. All the work that I have done in advocacy for environmental causes around gun violence, around political problems in the world, all the work that I have done trying to tell people that Jesus Christ really does love us and forgive us and that God has better things in store for us, I just don't believe it. I can't do it anymore. And she heard a voice say to her, your work is important, keep going. And she said, but it's overwhelming. And the voice said, your work is important, keep going. And my favorite part of the story, she, she said, I told the voice, I'm really tired. And the voice said, then take a nap <laughs> and get up and keep going. And it, I've changed parts of the story, I apologize. It's not quite the way she tells it, but that, that story is her own version of the story of God and Elijah. In 1 Kings, when Elijah says, God, no one's left to follow you. It's just me. And God says, all right, I've got the following jobs for you to do. And Elijah just kind of, okay, I'll keep going. Sometimes all we can do is cling to that voice that says, I know, keep going. Sometimes that's all that can get us up in the morning or keep us going during the day but it does keep us going. And that voice is the Holy Spirit calling us into the cross. Yes, I know, it's very bad. Keep going. Yes, I know you're tired, you should rest. And then get up and keep going. If we want to be the church, we follow the Holy Spirit to the cross. Wherever the world uses its crosses to enforce false peace, Christ is there with the suffering. And the Holy Spirit calls us to those places and says, you're God's children, do something. So when there is a mass shooting, we as the church do not say, we have all the answers, the answer is Jesus. We do say, cross. There's a cross here. Christ is in the grieving families and every effort on every side of the issue to do something sensible about it. And that issue is laughed at, shot down or shut down. The Spirit says, go there. I know it looks impossible, but that's where Jesus is and that is where we are to be because you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but a spirit of adoption, your God's children do something. The Holy Spirit keeps calling us into the cross. So when an anti-transgender bill becomes law in your state, the Spirit says, say cross. Christ is in the girl who can't play basketball because the legislature says so. Christ is in the man who was assaulted for trying to use the bathroom. Go there. Go to the cross. You did not receive the spirit of slavery, but a spirit of adoption. Your God's children do something. 
The Spirit keeps calling us into the cross. When we look at what is happening in our own denomination, and not just us, but yes, this is very much our own issue. Sometimes we must say, cross. Christ is in every minority group pitted against each other to protect whiteness. And Christ is in that congregation, anglicized name would be Saint Mary the Pilgrim, who lost their pastor and their funding on the highest holy day of the year, and yet want to be part of our denomination, but beg to know why they would trust us. The Spirit says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but a spirit of adoption. You're God's children. Do something. We face a question as Lutheran Christians whether we think this is just something that's happening out in Northern California or not, we face it ourselves. Do we believe that Christ exists to secure our being white middle class people? Or do we believe that we exist because Christ loves us? Are we a church of what it means to be white? Or are we a church of Christ who hangs on a cross so that all may be with him? So if we want to celebrate Pentecost as the church's birthday, even though I have my reasons, and I'll gladly share them with you afterwards, why that's not the idea, we can. We can celebrate Pentecost as the church's birthday. And on the church's birthday, the Holy Spirit says, go to the cross. Find the cross. It's, it's not that hard. There are a lot of them. And when you get there, Say it with her. Don't say this is peace when there is no peace. Say cross. Point to Jesus in that place. Amen.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, Father, Father, Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Holy Living One, by your Spirit, drive us out into the world, proclaiming your mighty deeds. Direct our words and actions as we trust the Advocate abiding in and among us. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Feed and care for creatures that contribute to the vibrancy of your creation and yet remain hidden to us. Train us to interact with creation from a place of wonder, awe, and reverence. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Send your spirit to places where violence and conflict persist. Especially give comfort and relief to the people of Ukraine and the hope that justice and mercy might prevail. Give wisdom and courage to the leaders of the nations to do what is necessary to bring about true freedom and lasting peace. God, in your mercy. Amen. We lift in prayer today all those who mourn the loss of loved ones, who lost their lives due to violence perpetrated by a gunman, especially those in Uvalde, Texas, Buffalo, New York, Port Richmond, Pennsylvania, and Taft, Oklahoma. Let your spirit spur our national lawmakers to action and inspire them to find solutions to the seemingly unending gun violence in this country. God, in your mercy. Comfort all who live in constant fear and who are grieving or suffering in mind, body, or spirit, especially Lauren, Keith, Lois, Betty, Susan, Phyllis, Thomas, Lois, Eden, Nikki, Stephanie, Barbara, Dolores, Karen and Bobby, Holly, Zelly, David, Bob, Sandy, and Marcy. Remind them that your spirit has made them your children and that they are never far from your glory. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide all bishops, pastors, missionaries, and other ministers of the gospel, especially presiding Bishop Elizabeth, I face Synod Bishop William and Pastor Tim. Foster our relationships with partner synods and local ministry partners, like the Christian Food Pantry and the First Contact, that our visions and actions are spirit-led. 
God in your mercy. Prayer, prayer. As Trinity embarks on a new era of youth ministry and education, give us guidance and wisdom to discern the path that will lead our young people to you and give them inspiration to move forward in their faith journeys. God in your mercy. Prayer, prayer. People of God, for what else shall we pray? For all these things, God, in your mercy, gather your people across regions, nations, and lands. Root our common life in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And by your spirit, bind us together with all the saints who have gone before us. God, in your mercy. In your mercy, O oh God. Respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the risen Christ be with you always.
we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, fulfilling the promise of the resurrection, you pour out the fire of your Spirit, uniting in one body people of every nation and tongue. And so, with Mary Magdalene and Peter, and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending
Praise to you, O beloved one. Praise to you, O giver of all good things. Praise to you, blessed and holy trinity, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The table of life is spread before you. Feast on the goodness and mercy of God.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth, where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I invite those with brief announcements to come use the pulpit microphone for those. Patricia Cummings from Faith in Action, and after the service today, we are going to be uh, collecting for uh, Mother's and Father's Day Gifts of Hope. The money will be going to Faith uh, to the First Contact, and um, the car that um, Kristen Renahan 
beautifully painted and Jane Schreiner and Abby, happy to make these beautiful cards. Um, will go to your favorite father that you love. Thank you. I love that you shrugged at me afterwards. Like, 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 like I did something. <laughs> One important announcement. We have been uh, at work for over a year on trying to uh, transform the uh, Sunday, the old preschool wing uh, into space that we can uh, use now that the preschool is no longer in that wing. Uh, we have a, a deadline we've been working with of a rummage sale for the central neighborhood, which is this Saturday. The, the biggest problem with that date is that they did not consult with the Indiana Kentucky Synod on when the Synod Assembly would be. And I, I mean, I admit I'm not entirely heartbroken that I have to be at Synod Assembly and can't be running a rummage sale. But I am upset that I can't be running the rummage sale because we have had a very hard time finding someone who can put it together. This is the final request. If there is someone who can manage having our rummage sale, trying to move items that have not been, uh, have not had a home found for them uh, in the old preschool wing, please let me know as soon as possible. If we can't get a group together to run the rummage sale, we simply won't be able to participate in it. We'll find another way to, to move those items. Um, we're, we're not gonna try to have a sale without somebody in charge. If you have questions, you think you might be interested, or, or you want to corner me and laugh at me afterwards, whatever, please please contact me uh, early this week, as fast as you can. Um, Synod Assembly is coming on Thursday. Michael Renahan, Nicole Lee, Jody Murphy, and I are Trinity's official uh, voting members who are going. Some other Trinity folks who are on the clergy roster or otherwise involved with church stuff will be there as well. Um, we'll have a report about that when we're here um, on Sunday following, following that assembly. Please join us downstairs for fellowship as a thanks to all of our musicians for their hard work during this past year. Um, that food is provided by the worship team and we are looking forward to enjoying it. Please stand. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever.
risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Go in peace. Tell what God has done. <laughs>